Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our breakfast meeting uh, this morning. Uh, my name is Francisco Villa, I'm the head of the European Union Office of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints here in Brussels, and we're very glad to have you uh, with us this morning for a presentation on law and religion with Professors Neil Foster and uh, Professor Neville uh, Rocco. Uh, this event, uh, this morning, uh, we're going to do a little experiment. We're going to live broadcast this uh, presentation online uh, on, uh, on our YouTube page. Um, we hope to have some of some viewers asking questions also from uh, from our YouTube page, and uh, and uh, we are excited to hear from from our new speakers who just came back from the Cardiff Law and Religious Festival, and uh, they will speak uh, about the complex relationship between law and religion through topics as freedom of conscience, religion or belief, responses to the proposed EU Equal Treatment Directive and the convenience of religiously informed consciences. And uh, though both will be pleased to share with us a uh, representation from Cardiff on the critical aspects of the EU Equal Treatment Directive and church-state relations, as well as other ideas and impressions on law and religious gathered at this uh, I mean, uh, conference which they just attended. Uh, we would like to introduce the panel and, uh, and how this will uh, we roll out. Our first speaker would be Professor Neil Foster. He's an associate professor of law at the Newcastle University Law School in Australia. He has published in the areas of freedom of religion, court law, property, and intellectual property. Together with a colleague, Lucy Wilk, he analyzed how the courts approach the balancing process in such conflicts, particularly in controversial, controversial areas such as same sex couples and religion. Neil is an evangelical Christian, an expert in numerous areas of law, a father and a grandfather. He is widely respected law and religion scholar who speaks regularly nationally in Australia and internationally. Uh, in particular, this morning, speaking, speaking about church-state relations, uh, he will address the specific case of legal responsibility of churches um, with regards to the Patriot Diocese case. Uh, Professor Foster, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Francesco, and it's a great privilege and honour to be able to be here and uh, talk to you about this issue. Um, you have on the table there, um, for those who are here, um, the full copy of the paper, which I'm very grateful was able to be produced. That's the one with the red card at the University logo at the top. But you also have um, a PowerPoint, uh, a set of PowerPoint slides, which we're meant to go with it anyway. Um, so whichever form you find easiest to follow along with, uh, you may find it helpful to, um, uh, to follow on. And I'll speak for about uh, 25 minutes, perhaps, and then stop. So uh, let me know, Francesco, if I'm going on too long. <laughs> One of the very, uh, very interesting issues in the law and religion area, um, particularly in the Anglo-Australian situation, although I think it's probably reflected elsewhere in the world, is the question of legal personality, as we call it, of the larger denominational churches. Uh, that is, the question is how one can sue or hold responsible um, a church such as the Church of England, uh, the Roman Catholic Church, um, other large denominational churches, um, when they enter into contracts uh, or when they are held liable for wrongdoing uh, in torts, as we call it in the, uh, in the English Australian system. And uh, this is a pressing need um, in the current era. Um, it's pressing because, of course, uh, churches, large churches such as these, um, enter into contractual relationships, um, enter into uh, the taking on of debts, and we'll see in particular the case I want to talk about today is a case to do with uh, issuing a, a taking on of a debt. But it's also a pressing need in relation to the tragic phenomenon of child sexual abuse perpetrated by clergy and questions of whether the denomination uh, can be held legally responsible in those circumstances, and if so, what sorts of funds can be used to pay damages. So those are the sorts of questions that are raised in uh, what I want to talk about today. And in particular, they come out of a case uh, before a single judge of the New South Wales Supreme Court in Australia, which is my own country. Um, I teach law uh, at uh, Newcastle Law School, not the Newcastle in the United Kingdom, uh, it's a regional city two hours north of Sydney in Australia. 
And the decision is uh, the one of Anglican Development Fund Diocese of Bathurst and Palmer from 2015, uh, which I'll call for short the Bathurst Diocese case, which uh, raises many of these issues. Before I go into the details, though, of the Bathurst Diocese case, from page two of the paper, I want to just generally uh, talk about the issue of the liability of denominations um, and um, how this works. I suppose many members of the community would be quite surprised to find that a lot, at least in our legal system, a number of the larger Christian denominations have no unified legal personality. Um, the problem is often not present with smaller or more recently established or independent congregations in our legal system. Many of those may have gone through a process of legal incorporation in some way. Uh, but for various reasons, particularly uh, the larger denominational churches, and I'll focus on the Anglican Church or the Roman Catholic Church, have not in the past been set up with overall legal personality. That is, they don't operate as legal persons in the legal system. Why this is the case is unclear, but historically, I suppose, the churches were so deeply involved in their local community, um, they had reasonably strong resource base, and they were regarded, as it were, as a good risk, so that if the church took on a, a debt, there was no doubt that somehow they would uh, find the money to pay it back. Um, but it has to be said that... Uh, the sort of situation of the churches and in particular the trust that many of them may have previously enjoyed is being undermined in more recent years. Um, and uh, sadly, one of the reasons that that trust has been eroded is evidence of matters such as child sexual abuse by clergy, uh, which is a terrible scourge, and confirmation that this has been concealed by senior leaders of churches in some cases. So in those circumstances, there's a need to think about how to hold churches accountable now, for many years, churches have uh, organised themselves to hold property. And in property holdings, often trusts have been set up uh, to provide that formal ownership structure. But the question that has come up in some cases is whether the trust that holds church property can be held accountable for obligations entered into by the church in other areas that don't directly relate to that property. If the church enters into a general contract, can the trust property be used to pay that debt if needed? If the church uh, is held accountable for some wrongful act, can the trust property be used? And uh, that is one of the difficult issues uh, that has come up. As I say towards the bottom of page two, there are really only a limited range of options for a group to have identity and role in the legal system. Um, at one end of the spectrum, it's, it's just simply treated by the courts as an undifferentiated mass of people. And the technical term that's used is an unincorporated association. That is, it's an association, but it only consists of the number of people who are members of that association. It doesn't have a separate legal identity. Uh, on the other hand, at the other end of the spectrum, you may have something formally established or set up by an act of parliament. And somewhere in the middle, uh, you may have it operating as uh, an incorporated body under some legislative regime. Uh, but there are uh, very few formal incorporation statutes establishing uh, churches. For example, there's no formal statute establishing the Church of England in the United Kingdom. Uh, indeed, I suppose part of the function of that is that the Church of England existed long before it developed a practice for parliaments to pass legislation. It's been historically around for a long time. Um, in Australia, we've had property trusts and others that have set up property. But in the middle of page three of the paper, uh, or if you're following in the PowerPoints, um, uh, at the top of the second page of the PowerPoints, I want to talk about, in particular, the uh, decision of the trustees of the Roman Catholic Church in Ellis, which has been a, a, a case that illustrates some of the difficulties in this area. Um, the, uh, uh, Mr. Ellis was suing uh, the Roman Catholic Church because he had been sexually abused as a child by a priest. This had happened a number of years ago. Uh, the bishop who had appointed the priest had now retired and left. The priest, I think, had passed away. Uh, the question was, could the current property trust holding property on behalf of the Roman Catholic Church, be held accountable for this debt. And the New South Wales Court of Appeal said that they could not, um, that the, uh, uh, the individual clergyman, of course, could have been held accountable, but he was no longer available. Uh, the bishop who had appointed the clergyman could perhaps have been held accountable, but he himself had retired. The current bishop of Sydney, uh, who uh, is, uh, was at the time, uh, the person who's later become Cardinal George Pell, uh, was not responsible because he was not the person who had uh, sheltered the priest or um, employed the priest. Uh, and the property trust that held the 
the deeds to the property of the Catholic Church could not be held accountable because the property trust did not supervise the work of the clergy. And the court said that for those reasons, there were no funds available to pay these damages. So the Ellis case has raised uh, serious legal issues in Australia and has been regarded uh, as a, a very sad case. And indeed, um, pragmatically, as it were, since that time, uh, the church has often not formally pleaded that defence because it's very bad publicity, of course, if I can put it that way. It's, it's also bad morals for the church to deny responsibility for these things. But legally speaking, the decision there was that the property trust could not be held accountable. Now, uh, that is indeed then the, the effect under Australian law for some of these bigger denominations. And there are a couple of cases I mentioned which I won't go into in further detail, but the Victorian Work Cover Authority case accepted evidence that the Archdiocese of Melbourne of the Roman Catholic Church was an unincorporated association. Um, and uh, again, there was no uh, ability for the Archdiocese to be held accountable. Um, and there's a, a couple of other cases. Just to quote there from Justice Campbell in the middle of page four of the paper under the uh, TGP Architects case, the civil law does not recognise a parish as having any separate legal personality. And it does not recognise a church or a parish as having any separate legal personality. Uh, rather, churches and parishes are voluntary, unincorporated associations in the eyes of the civil law. Now, if something's an unincorporated association, this does not mean that the people involved uh, have any immunity. It simply means uh, that there is a, a difficult question as to which of the people involved in the association can be held accountable. One option is to hold every single member of that association accountable. That's going to be logistically very difficult to sue a large number of people. Another option is to hold the management committee of that organisation personally accountable. And sometimes that option has been followed in the past. A decision in my local area of Sturt and the Right Reverend Dr Brian Farron, Bishop of Newcastle, involved this question. Again, a sad case of child sexual abuse by clergy. Two members of the clergy were uh, accused of having been involved in sexual activity with a minor. Uh, they were disciplined under church rules. They were uh, uh, defrocked is a term that's sometimes used. At any rate, they, were, uh, they had their clerical authority taken away from them. They then appealed this uh, action. Uh, one of the responses that the church made was that, well, we're an unincorporated association and um, you know, there's no legal avenue for the priests. The court rejected that argument because they said that the priests um, livelihood depended on their standing in the association and therefore there were legal remedies that were available when someone's um, ability to earn money as it were or the status that they have in the society depends on the association. So the, uh, the court said that yes there was uh, an action that they could have taken uh, but in the end the court concluded that the uh, appropriate um, uh, actions had been followed by the by the, by the diocese and uh, that their dismissal was justified. So uh, there's, this, uh, there's a number of issues that are raised in these areas um, and uh, they are the ones that light the background then um, of the Bathurst Diocese case. So I'll, I'll probably turn now to that particular case uh, on page six of the paper is where I start to discuss the case. The Anglican Diocese of Bathurst is part of the Anglican Church of Australia, one of 23 dioceses in Australia. Um, many of you, perhaps, if you know this area, will know that uh, the Anglican Church is, is, is not um, centrally run, as it were. Not a, uh, the, uh, the Archbishop of Canterbury speaks in, in broad terms in many cases for the Anglican Church, but around the world, individual bishops have a great deal of control over their local area. Um, formerly, the diocese is presided over by a synod, which is a meeting of all the clergy, representatives of the clergy and laity. Uh, in between the meetings, there's a body called the Bishop in Council, which is a sort of executive committee uh, that runs things. Um, the other key player in these proceedings was a corporate body known as the Anglican Development Fund, Diocese of Bathurst, ADF, uh, which was established uh, to set up a particular scheme. Uh, and at the top of page seven, I sort of described that scheme that was established in the words of the judge. Uh, it was decided that the diocese uh, in 2007 would go after a fashion into the business of banking, and ADF was chosen to be the diocesan banker. The idea was that instead of parishes borrowing money from commercial banks in dribs and drabs, the diocese would borrow a large amount of money and then lend it on to diocesan entities. Uh, one can pause for a moment and say, 
yes, getting involved a bunch of clergy and becoming large-scale bankers, what a wonderful idea that sounds like. Well, it, uh, it, it actually proved to be disastrous, <laughs> as a matter of fact. Uh, to cut a long story short, they borrowed a large amount of money, some $40 million from the Commonwealth Bank. Um, they then lent this money uh, towards the establishment of two church schools, which they were establishing in Bathurst. By the way, just to give you a bit of context for those who are not from Australia, Bathurst is a regional city in the, in the centre of New South Wales. It's, um, it's not the capital city of Australia. Uh, it always has, has, has struggled with funding. Uh, and so they thought, well, we'll run some church schools and maybe we'll make some money that way to keep the ministry going. Well, disastrous decisions were taken. The schools were not self-sustaining. Advisors kept on going to the diocesan fund and saying, hang on, this money is being wasted. You need to do something. And they kept on saying, no, no, let's give them some more. Let's give them some more. So unfortunately, the inevitable happened and the diocese is, uh, well, run, can't pay its debts. It's virtually bankrupt. Um, and the, uh, the bank in terms of the security that took over this arrangement, did not take the title deeds to pieces of property. As I say in the middle of page uh, seven, uh, contrary to its normal practice, didn't require a mortgage over land. It agreed to accept a thing called a letter of comfort provided by the bishop, the right Reverend Richard Burford. Um, and the letter of comfort simply says, we promise <laughs> that we will pay back. Although if you look at the letter, and I've given you a copy uh, on pages 17 and 18 of the paper, uh, the precise terms are there. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a, it's a very formal legal sounding document. I confirm, he says, uh, pursuant to clause two of the Anglican Church Finance Ordinance that the Baptist Diocese accepts responsibility by way of an advance, um, committed to meeting its powers, uh, exercising its powers to, um, to pay the loan back. So this is a letter of comfort that was issued. Um, this letter of comfort was issued though by the diocese and the, the bishop at the time in 2007. Um, now, in 2013, the uh, ADF defaulted on its loan. By that time, or shortly thereafter, that bishop had resigned. Uh, and so we then have a new bishop involved. Uh, and then there are real issues about whether the commitment made by the previous bishop is binding on the current bishop. Uh, real issues involved on who were the persons who should be sued here, given that the Anglican Diocese of Bathurst, like pretty well every other Anglican Diocese in Australia, is an unincorporated association. Um, and so the issues, uh, do you sue every member of the Anglican Church in the Diocese of Bathurst? As the judge pointed out, well, probably wouldn't be all that helpful, especially since all they would have to do is formally say they resigned from the Anglican Church and that they would, they would be out of the action. Um, the, the most likely uh, response was to try and sue the individual members of the Bishop in Council Executive Committee. And so uh, they were, in fact, as part of these proceedings, sued by the receivers who'd taken over the Diocesan Fund and in fact found to be personally liable uh, is a puzzling aspect of the proceedings to me is that, that part of that was settled. I'm not sure where the funds came from. I suspect perhaps there were individual directors and officers insurance policies, but $3 million or so was found from the personal assets of the board members, but this still left quite a deficit. So uh, I mentioned on page, five, uh, page eight some of the issues that were uh, discussed by the court. Um, uh, was there an intention to enter into legal relationships, which is an aspect of a binding contract in our legal system? If so, with whom was the bank entering into a contract? And uh, of course, another complication was that the members of the Bishop in Council Board, uh, when the loan was taken out, had now changed and there was a new Bishop in Council Board. So were they responsible for the actions of the previous board? Um, and uh, the other issue which came up in the case was, uh, if church property is to be used to pay off the debt, what do you do with the fact that a number of pieces of that property are held in trust on charitable trusts for certain religious purposes? And can they be diverted to paying off the debts of the diocese uh, from those trusts? So those are the sorts of issues. And it has to be said that uh, the diocese uh, fought the matter vigorously and uh, took every possible legal point. There's a quote that I give you at the bottom of page eight from the judge, and the tone of his comments will uh, show you that he wasn't all that sympathetic to the diocese. Uh, he says a general synopsis of the position might be the following. Uh, the BIC, the, uh, the Council of the Diocese, denies the existence of the diocese as an institution capable of incurring obligations which it formally and solemnly undertook. Denies the authority of its former bishop and titular and spiritual head to have incurred obligations on its behalf, which he formally and solemnly undertook. Denies that obligations formally and solemnly undertaken are legally binding. 
denies the existence of formal documents of obligation, denies that ordinances passed to give protection to lenders are effective. Everything was denied by the diocese. Not a really good look, and in the end, all those points were lost by the diocese. Uh, the judge was, had very little sympathy uh, for that approach. Let me then, in the time that I have, give you a brief summary of the issues and how the court resolved them. Uh, the first one, as I say, from page nine in the paper, um, or if you're following on the PowerPoints, um, halfway through page five of the PowerPoints, is this question of intent to create legal relations. Uh, in the Anglo-Australian legal context, to have a contract, this is one of the essential elements of the contract, you must be able to show that the parties intended to enter into binding legal obligations. Here, uh, the church tried to take this point, but of course the court dismissed it very quickly. The letter that you've seen there at the back of the thing could hardly look more legal. Um, there was clearly a formal intention on the part at the time of the bank to have a legal remedy for giving over this large amount of money. So the court said there was clearly an intention on both the clergyman, the bishop, uh, and, the, uh, and the bank that there be some sort of legal remedy at the time. The second issue was the more difficult question of who were the contracting parties. Uh, the court reaffirmed the view that, indeed, uh, the church itself, uh, as the judge said at the top of page 10 of the paper, at no level does the church itself have it in, as an institution have corporate existence. Um, I remember uh, I teach a course in law and religion to law students and I got the local Anglican bishop to come in a year or two ago to talk to my class. And he said, hello, I'm Bishop Peter from the Diocese of Newcastle. Although I have to tell you the Diocese of Newcastle doesn't exist. <laughs> and uh, um, contrary to what you might think, this is the legal status, as it were. These things don't, do have no corporate existence. Um, and so, uh, as the judge then said, a voluntary association does not in law have any existence apart from its members and itself can acquire no rights and no obligations. Now, uh, as we've said before, one of the options that you can have is then to sue the management committee of this organisation. And there's a case there called the Bradley Egg Farm case from a number of years ago where that happened. And uh, here uh, then there was a question of being able to sue the Bishop in Council, the BIC committee. The question that then arose was, which one could you sue, the current one or the previous one? And following a South Australian decision in Harrington and Coote, uh, the court held that where someone becomes an office holder of the church in this way, they are deemed to accept personal responsibility for actions taken by their predecessors. So that's an interesting lesson for those who choose to go on committees of churches. Um, but that's what the court said was the, uh, the legal situation. And so uh, the judge said that when the bishop entered into this obligation, he did so on behalf of the committee, and uh, he meant to bind himself and the committee and their successors. Uh, to carry out these obligations. Um, and uh, in the end then, uh, the court said that the BIC were taken to have assumed the obligations entered into uh, by the earlier group. Um, now, finding that the successive committee here is deemed to be legally responsible for things done by their predecessors is uh, understandable in this case. Although, as I point out in the middle of page 11, it's slightly inconsistent with the Ellis decision that I mentioned previously about tort obligation, where the successive Bishop of Sydney was not held responsible for previous actions of his predecessor. So there's some tension in this area developing between the law of contract and the law of tort in this area. Um, I won't spend too much time on point three. It's a specific statutory point relating to New South Wales legislation, but the court did say that a provision of the Supreme Court Act which allowed the court to order a person to fulfil a duty, could be used here because the individual members of the committee had assumed a duty uh, to undertake repayment um, of, the, uh, of the property. Uh, and in fact, the duty they undertook was to require the church to pass legislation, a church ordinance, to liquidate church assets if needed to pay back the debt. So those were the sorts of duties that they'd undertaken. On page 13 of the paper at point four, I refer to the question of using church trust funds other than as explicitly authorised by the um, uh, terms of the trust deed. And the judge here, Justice Hammerschlag, said that um, uh, yes, there were various trust deeds that held church property, uh, but he found that there was either the case that if there was a trust for the general purposes of the church, that could be interpreted as covering the debts entered, to, by, entered into by the bishop. Alternatively, it was a trust for the purposes of a particular parish, uh, St. Saviour's Goulburn or something like that, um, 
then uh, he said it would be in the interest of a particular parish that its diocese not go bankrupt, and therefore he said that they could use those funds to pay the debts as well. Um, our uh, individual parishioners may differ. In fact, there's been a great deal of controversy in the Diocese of Bathurst and fear as to which church properties are going to be sold, uh, but that's what the court ruled. Um, the court also ruled that a certain piece of legislation called the Anglican Church Trust Property Act um, actually allowed the Bishop in Council Committee to alter the terms of trust deeds if need be. That's a very radical step to take, but uh, the judge said that the literal meaning of the provision allowed the alteration of trust deeds if needed be to pay debts. And so towards the bottom of page 14 of the paper, I, I uh, sum it up by saying that the BIC were ordered to comply with an obligation uh, under uh, clause 32 of an ordinance there which says that uh, should there be any deficiency in funds, Bishop in Council shall promote an ordinance to levy the necessary funds from the parishes. The judge said the diocese could choose which funds, which, which, uh, which properties it wanted to sell. He wouldn't get involved in ordering them to do this. And indeed, one of the ironies of the case was that the current bishop, Bishop Palmer, and I should have made this clear before, when cross-examined in the litigation, said that he was willing to pay the debts back, but his lawyers had told him not to. <laughs> so uh, uh, hard to win a case like that when your client is saying, I'm happy to pay. Uh, well, what he meant was, I'm happy to liquidate property from the diocese to pay. But uh, whoever was instructing counsel, uh, I assume perhaps the insurance company, uh, was determined to fight the case. Um, so in the end, uh, this was ordered. If you see in the middle of page 15, I've given you a brief uh, summary of the latest outlook, which I got uh, from an internet uh, source on the 25th of April. I think it's a reliable internet source. Um, the Synod of the Diocese of Bathurst and the Anglican Church of Australia has authorised its bishop to sell 10 church properties, including All Saints College, which was a church school that was actually making a profit, but they're going to have to sell it now. <coughs> Uh, and uh, nine other properties uh, to satisfy this multi-million dollar debt. I understand from other things I've heard that they're not selling any actual parish churches, so they may own other buildings that they are selling. Uh, presumably those other buildings were generating some income from the church, but they're just going to have to sell them to pay this current debt. Uh, and there's an open question, of course, as to whether the church really is now officially bankrupt, as it were, after these, uh, these proceedings. Um, briefly then, uh, and I should finish off uh, my presentation, evaluation and implications. Um, I think the, there's an imp interesting possible implication for, this is a contract case, this is a case about contracts, but there may be implications for the way the courts in Australia deal with tort obligations in the future. If the view is now more widely accepted that successors of office holders can be held responsible for the actions of their predecessors, um, in this sort of situation. The Ellis case may need to be rethought. The Ellis case has been controversial ever since it was handed down. It is a decision of the New South Wales Court of Appeal, which is one level below our final Court of Appeal, the High Court of Australia, and so it's never been fully affirmed by the High Court of Australia. It may be under challenge. Uh, pragmatically, the other thing that's happening in Australia, and we're not sure whether everyone would have heard of this, but we are having a major royal commission in Australia into institutional child abuse and its implications. This has been long running, it's been very well funded, it's been very good exercise. And it seems to me that the, well, I know that one of the, the uh, recommendations they make um, is that there should be access to property funds given to survivors of child abuse and that there should be legislation passed to allow that to happen. So it may be these sorts of issues in, uh, in tort cases uh, will be altered by Parliament choosing to legislate uh, for churches in the future. Um, so as I conclude at the end, uh, I think the finding of the, of the court is a sensible one. It may be true in strict legal theory that there's no such thing as the Anglican Church or the Roman Catholic Church, but their solid buildings and other regular public pronouncements lead most ordinary members of the community to suspect that rumours of their non-existence are much exaggerated. Uh, most, I think, would say, yes, the church exists, where a senior member of the clergy accepts an obligation to pay back money that he intended to do so and that the church should be required to liquidate uh, property to uh, satisfy the judgment. Uh, and I think the other thing the judgment does is hopefully provide even more incentive than previously for churches to ensure that proper financial oversight is provided when expensive undertakings are entered into with church members' money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Fossey. <clears throat> this was a great
interesting presentation looking into a case uh, that uh, described the legal uh, and complex structure of the Anglican Church, <clears throat> as well the case law relating to church property financing authority. Um, I assume that this case would be of interest also to many other denominations in uh, in, uh, in Australia as well. Uh, yes. We will now we will now uh, hear from Professor Rocco, but we will take questions uh, from the audience here and uh, and online uh, after Professor Rocco's presentation. Uh, let me just introduce Neville. <clears throat> Neville is a member of our office since July 2015. Um, I feel very lucky <clears throat> that he is uh, with his wife Penny. Uh, here in Brussels, uh, in Brussels with us. Um, Neville works as a government relations representative here in, uh, in Brussels at the EU Office of the Church. Uh, he enjoyed a long and distinguished legal career in Australia, where he practiced as a barrister for many years. He appeared in several juris jurisdictions across the country in complex case, cases of trials and on appeal, as well as before tribunals, petitions and parliamentary inquiries. He is a member of the research unit of, uh, for the study of society, law, and religion at the University of Adelaide Law School, where he holds an adjunct associate professorship, and he is an adjunct professor at Notre Dame University Law School in Sydney. He and his wife Penny uh, have been here in Brussels uh, since July 2015, and uh, will be here for one more year. And uh, we'll now hear from. Uh, uh, Thank you very much for that introduction, Francesco, and I should say that it's our true delight to be able to work with uh, Francesco and also with uh, so many of you in this room. I, I welcome friends old and new that are here today. Um, you do us a great honour by being here. and We thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedules to be with us today. Um, I think it's only fair that I should make an addendum to the introduction to uh, to Neil Foster. Um, as you would have gathered from his introduction, he is a person of many dimensions. And I'll leave it to you to decide which is the cause and which is the effect, but he's a profoundly committed uh, fan of Doctor Who. <laughs> so to him, to him, things are timeless. And and he he is in many respects a time lord himself. <laughs> but uh, uh, we've really enjoyed being with Neil for the last couple of days. We've spent some time in Cardiff with him, where he first made the presentation that we've heard this morning. Um, and uh, we also were privileged to have him as a house guest over the last couple of days, and it's been a wonderful time with him. He's been, been an old friend. Uh, um, some years ago, I was making a presentation at the Australian National University, and uh, somebody described me as a member of the Australian Law and Religion Mafia. I didn't even know there was such a mafia, but uh, I think if I'm if I'm a member, then Neil must be close to becoming a godfather. <laughs> <laughs> and, but whether he's a godfather or not, he's certainly a very proud grandfather. Um, so um, just moving on to the things I'll be talking about this morning, you have in front of you uh, the slides that were extracted from my PowerPoint presentation for part of, and I commend those to you for your consideration. You also have before you a pamphlet of an article that was recently published by the, the BYU Law Review, An Incurable Malaise, and then goes on to describe two cases contrasting an Australian case on appeal and an American case on appeal. And I describe those two cases as being uh, early symptoms of uh, onset dystopia. And uh, my point is this, that we um, are children of the Enlightenment in many respects. We enjoy liberal democratic values in the way that we live our lives in the West, and uh, we have many freedoms. And in many respects, one could describe the uh, natural successor of the Enlightenment, the uh, concept of a, a utopia, a, a land where things uh, are run perfectly well, first described by Sir Thomas More, or St. Sir Thomas More, uh, in fact, 600 years ago this year. Um, but uh, I think that you will find in fictional literature, and perhaps in the political literature of today, 
uh, descriptions of what is the opposite, which is a dystopia, where many of those freedoms are, in, uh, are either at risk or being taken away. And so I want to juxtapose those two ideas of a utopia and a dystopia by reference to what I call unusual juxtapositions. Just to illustrate a few unusual juxtapositions, let me give you uh, a few examples that I've observed. I used to park my car in a car park that had signs on it uh, indicating where one should drive and how one can get to the higher levels of the car park in order to find somewhere to place their vehicle. And one sign indicating the route had the words fast up. And so that indicated that that was the fast way up to the top. The other one right next to it said slow down. So to me that was an unusual juxtaposition. Um, another, another thing that I think is an unusual sign that you see frequently in buildings is it says keep this door closed at all times. Why do you put a door there? Why not just a wall? Um, and then the other day when we were in uh, London Heathrow, we, we noticed a couple of signs. And one of the signs said, <coughs> if you have any complaints, let us know. But then the sign right next to it says, we will not tolerate abuse. So again, yet another unusual uh, juxtaposition. And I think we have some unusual juxtapositions uh, uh, both in our current uh, daily life, but also in our work as people who are interested in religion, its place in society, and in the freedoms that are attendant upon it. I think that we find that religious freedom, or freedom of conscience, or freedom of belief, freedom of expression, is uh, often um, conflicted in uh, experience and also in the cases with freedom from discrimination. And it seems that the courts or society is called upon to decide one uh, as being uh, the particular right that would trump the other. And my, my thesis is a simple one. I think that we need to rethink this type of paradigm. I think we need to be looking for a way of achieving a better balance than we have currently. And I argue in my longer paper that you have in front of you that if we don't, then we're heading from what might be considered a utopia into a dystopia. And uh, I'll come, I'll speak more about dystopias in a moment, but I think we do need to strike that balance. I think one of the areas in which we need to strike that balance is indeed in the uh, some of the legislation that is currently before the uh, European Council, and in particular, the Equal Treatment Directive. The Equal Treatment Directive, as many, many of you would know, was passed by the Parliament some years ago, and it's yet to re receive its imprimatur from the uh, from the Council. And I think that it is a, a, a misnomer to call it the Equal Treatment Directive because I think it does anything other than treat people equally. What it does instead is it uh, valorises certain uh, certain attributes and certain traits in people. It uh, Preferences, preferences those traits and those uh, that, those uh, attributes above those that others might have. And how that works, I'll illustrate by reference to an Australian case that I'll discuss, which is the, the uh, Christian youth camps case. And I'll come to that as well in a moment. So I suggest strongly that the current regime that we have needs to be recalibrated and that rights need to be uh, re-examined so that there is indeed an equality in the rights that we enjoy uh, within the various regimes under which we live. Now one might say that uh, uh, this is uh, a utopian view that I'm expressing today and uh, I would plead guilty to that. Uh, but my, my arguments I think are more addressed possibly to legislators than to courts but I think also courts are guilty, as in the case of the Christian Youth Care Camps case, of uh, subscribing too readily to this preferencing of one set of rights over the other. So I've, I've headed my paper, uh, Finding Balance, an Ethical or Reasoned Response to the Proposed EU Equal Treatment Directive. 
but I've also given it uh, an alternative, uh, an alternative uh, title, which is about the incurable malaise and uh, the dystopia that we're beginning to suffer from. Um, perhaps I can turn first to the equal treatment, oh, sorry, to the uh, case at hand, which is the COBOL case or the Christian Youth Camps case. Um, Christian Youth Camps uh, were, uh, well, uh, the, the organization administered, among other things, a particular facility in uh, rural Victoria in, in, in Australia. And uh, it was run effectively through a corporate structure by the Christian Brethren. And the Christian Brethren, for those of you who don't know, are a very uh, uh, conservative, uh, very uh, profoundly fundamental Christian group. Uh, they are very quiet in their Christianity. They don't make any trouble for anyone. They are quiet, they are inoffensive, they are thoroughly good people. They are people with whom you'd be proud to associate in any setting or any circumstance. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> but they received a phone call one day from a representative of a, uh, a, a council that ran um, psychological support for homosexual youth. And Cobol was one of the people who was uh, involved in that. And they requested whether they could uh, use the camp facility to run a workshop on counselling troubled youth who were homosexual and to help them in their homosexual lifestyle and choices. Um, to cut a long story short, the answer was no, we won't do that. They then found themselves hauled up before the uh, Equal Treatment Tribunal, oh, sorry, the uh, Equal Opportunity Tribunal, and then ultimately in the Court of Appeal of Victoria. Um, the short answer to it all is they lost. Uh, the legislation that, under which they were sued gave rights to those who felt that they were discriminated and gave certain exemptions to religious bodies uh, who were uh, refusing a, a good or a service based upon their eschatology and their, their belief. Um, the individual who was sued in the group uh, succeeded in that defence. Uh, he was able to uh, successfully invoke that defence and say that I was acting according to our beliefs. Um, but the corporation, which was closely held and strictly controlled by church members, did not succeed um, because it was held that it did not have a conscience. Uh, it could not uh, have a religious belief. It was a corporation. Now, that brings us to yet what I think is another unusual juxtaposition. Because what was held in the Court of Appeal was by the majority that the most important thing was that the homosexual group was being discriminated against by, a, by an aspect of their character, their sexual identity or their sexual preference, which was fundamental to their identity. They, they could not be identified other than by reference to their homosexuality being a part of their identification. And so the, the majority of the court, uh, the uh, 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 president of the court, Maxwell, and uh, Justice of Appeal, Neve, held that that was not uh, something that could really be challenged under, under the legislation. Interestingly, in their, in their discussion of uh, how that would be arrived at, as a matter of legal reasoning, they drew upon a number of pieces of European uh, legislation and European decisions and got the jurisprudence just wrong. They actually <coughs> failed to refer to some of the most recent cases, which added another aspect of the jurisprudence that would have been favourable to the Christian youth camps. They actually misconstrued some of the, uh, some of the covenants under which uh, people were suing and being sued and the, uh, the interpretation that came about. So the majority, just on any reading, was wrong on their analysis of European and human rights law. The, the minority judge, Justice Redley, um, produced a very tightly reasoned dissent. But in the end, he said, in the same way that homosexual youth and those who counsel them 
cannot leave their identity out when they walk out into the world. They identify themselves as being uh, gay or homosexual. So the person who is religious and who has a religiously informed con uh, uh, conscience cannot be expected to park that conscience at the door when they leave to go to work or to enter into commerce. So that's, that's one juxtaposition that I think is quite uncomfortable that comes out of this particular case. And indeed, I think, will flow through the Equal Treatment Directive if it were to become legislation. The, the second uh, juxtaposition that I think is quite uncomfortable is that the court found that although the individual was able to avail himself of the defences that were available under the particular uh, piece of legislation at sections 75 and 77, um, that the corporation could not do so because corporations, as I said before, do not have beliefs or conscience. And yet, what we have uh, in Australia at the moment, and you'll see this in the paper when you, if you come to read my, my article, um, you'll see that at the moment there is a, a, a full-scale debate in Australia as to whether Australia will have same-sex marriage or not. And rather, that, rather than that being decided by the courts, as it has been in some jurisdictions, in particular uh, at the moment the United States, and uh, more recently some of the South American jurisdictions, <coughs> it has been promised by the government that it won't even be decided by parliament, but that it will be decided by a plebiscite where the entire population will be polled and they will make the decision as to whether parliament should act upon that and legislate. Now, that, that I think is an enlightened view. I think it's an appropriate view. I think it's one that uh, does give people ownership of what is a very long, timeless and boundless uh, institution, which is that of marriage, how it should be defined. But um, while COBOR, the Christian Youth Camps case, would seem to gag uh, Christian groups or religious groups that may be opposed to same-sex marriage because they would offend uh, discrimination legislation by speaking out in particular contexts, the corporations that have supported what is called marriage equality, uh, some 386 of them, are all public corporations and are allowed to bring not only bring their conscience into the marketplace, but actually advertise what their position is without fear or impunity. And so again, we have this juxtaposition where the, the small closely held corporation, where the shareholders are the operators, uh, they may be the corner delicatessen, they may be the, the coffee shop, they may be uh, the hotel, whatever it might be, they obviously will be running a corporation as a matter of uh, commercial convenience that will reflect very closely their values. They, they, the court is saying those values cannot be reflected through the corporation. But large corporations that have a diffuse number of shareholders, perhaps many thousands or tens of thousands of shareholders, all of whom will have different views, can have a conscience can enter into the marketplace, can advocate for certain views. The juxtaposition becomes even more compound, I think, when we consider that there, when we go around Brussels, we see um, a particular sticker that is put on a number of small business stores complaining about whether there should be a re-election of the current mayor of Brussels and uh, making their point very clear that they don't want him again because he was never democratically elected in the first place. So these small corporations can bring their political conscience into the commercial sphere, but if a religiously motivated uh, sticker were to be put on the door, in Australia at least, that would be found to be discriminatory, illegal, and uh, the people would be prosecuted. So we have, um, we have an inequality in what we call our equality legislation. And I think these are unenlightened views because if you think about a utopia. Let's see if we can describe a utopia. We would have free speech. We would have freedom of association, freedom of trade. We would have uh, ability to dissent uh, both politically and as, on matters of conscience. We would have no state controlled or indeed socially controlled ideology. And we would not be monitored or watched over by a big brother uh, type of uh, government that would be looking over our shoulders. And, most importantly, we would have um, freedom of religion, freedom of expression as to our religious beliefs, freedom of 
uh, freedom of conscience. But when you move to dystopia, and we have a number of examples of dystopia in the literature, literature that has been published over the last century, um, we have uh, Orwell and we have uh, Huxley and uh, some of the others talking about these dystopias where there is quite the opposite. There is uh, no freedom of speech. There is a constant state monitoring. There is uh, strict control of ideology. There is uh, no room for dissent. Trade is strictly regulated, and the association of individuals is regulated. But most importantly, all the literature that I've read in this uh, particular genre is silent about religion. It's not even mentioned. In other words, somewhere historically in the past, religion was obliterated from the national identity. It no longer existed. And that, I would respectfully submit to you all, is the pathway that we're beginning to take now, and that's why I would say that we have early onset dystopia, because we are closing down the ability for the conscience to be expressed in the public sphere. We are closing down the ability for people to express their religious beliefs in the public sphere. And so we are heading uh, quite quickly, in my respectful submission, towards uh, a dystopia where freedom of conscience, religion and belief are uh, uh, taken away, where the prophecies, as it were, of Huxley, Orwell, Bradbury, Dick and Atwood are uh, coming to pass, and where we will find many of the values of the Enlightenment distorted and skewed and taken away and placed in a way that they were never intended to be. Can I just give one last juxtaposition uh, that I find unusual? We find, uh, if we look on our recent history, that uh, etiquette in our normal social discourse has been embellished by a concept called political correctness. So we are directed by our peers and by our uh, social acceptance not to offend people in terms of attributes by, by referring to them in neutral terms or by, by being, as the vernacular goes, politically correct. And that has been with us probably now, in my experience, for about 20 years in the Western world. Um, it started as a, as a new fashion, then became somewhat accepted, and even people that didn't necessarily believe in political correctness would nevertheless be politically correct in the way they spoke. Then what happened was legislatures started to grab this concept of political correctness and started to make it a crime not to be politically correct. And what they did was they started to um, imbue certain groups of society with certain additional rights that they didn't have before. And they did so in what I think is a fairly presumptuous approach to say that these people are so weak and so uh, invalid in their, in their uh, social discourse, they need to be specially protected. Now, to some extent, there did, did need to be some recalibration uh, to make some things correct that weren't correct. I have no compunction about uh, saying that. But I think the dial has been twisted just a little too far and that we have now the opposite problem of that which we were trying to at first correct through political correctness. And so we have a question before us as to whether we're going to allow political correctness to be a shield, as it once was when it was a social uh, norm, when it was a, a matter of etiquette, as opposed to it's becoming virtually a cocoon so that people are developing a right never to be offended in respect of anything at all. And, and what we're doing is we're finding, down, finding a closing down of social commentary, we're finding a closing down of humour, we're finding a closing down of freedom of speech and, and uh, commentary, but we're also finding that people cannot live their religion or their conscience in certain ways because someone might take offence. To me, I would respectfully say that that is not only an unusual, but a completely unacceptable juxtaposition. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Rafa, for, for your presentation on, uh, on the relationship between freedom of religion, of thoughts, and of conscience with regards to discrimination laws. And, uh,
and uh, this has been very interesting. Thank you both for, for your, uh, your presentation this morning. Uh, we will now be taking questions, uh, both from here and from, uh, uh, from our viewers online, if we, uh, if we have uh, questions. Um, we have about 30 minutes. And uh, before the end, though, I, I would like to ask maybe at the end uh, our speakers to uh, maybe uh, tell us a final final remarks on, uh, on the most important uh, aspects of the presentation. Uh, I'd like actually to start with a couple of questions. Uh, one for one for each speaker. To Professor Foster, I was was wondering with my limited knowledge of law and contract law. Um, Still, I understand that a letter of comfort is not a legally binding document. However, uh, it has been considered such in uh, in this case. Uh, can you can you ex can you tell us whether this will have a long lasting implication for uh, in uh, uh, for these kind of documents uh, in in the future? And uh, and for Professor Rocco. Uh, you mentioned concerns about the Equal Treatment Directive uh, that is currently at the Council. Uh, could you please elaborate on those aspects that you consider the most critical and, and why you consider them such? Thank you, Francesco. Um, my uh, comment would broadly be that if you have a document, uh, it, whether it's called a letter of comfort or whatever it's called, um, uh, and if even if in the past it might have been thought not to have had any legal effect, this case will definitely suggest that it uh, it, it does have a legal effect. The uh, um, as I said, perhaps because in the past it was assumed uh, that you could have, as it were, a, a, what was used to be called a gentleman's agreement, where people would undertake obligations, and those were invariably met. There was no need to take matters to the courts, but. We are in a situation now, uh, certainly in Australia, where the, many of the traditional uh, denominational churches um, are finding uh, themselves in financial difficulties. Um, they are certainly asset rich in the broad sense that they have some of them large, uh, impressive looking church buildings, but uh, the ability to liquidate those assets is very limited. Um, and uh, in terms of income, they are finding themselves very stretched. And so I think uh, these sorts of arrangements, which previously would have been thought to have been binding, as it were, on a handshake basis, uh, I think the courts will increasingly say, well, this has been entered into uh, very clearly with a view to uh, creating uh, binding legal obligations. And yes, in future, I, I think this sort of case uh, will indicate that uh, churches will be held accountable uh, in those circumstances. Um, yes, on the Equal Treatment Directive, I think there are a few things that one can point to as uh, being problematic with it. I think, first of all, uh, at the more general level, it is a very badly drafted piece of legislation. Um, in fact, uh, I think that most, uh, most, the most drafters of legislation will be embarrassed to put up such a poorly drafted piece of legislation for passage through both Parliament and then uh, through the, the uh, Council. So that's the first one, but I think that's a trivial criticism. More substantive criticisms, uh, criticisms I think, are these, that uh, it uh, effectively works on, on, on a supposition of reversal of the onus of proof. And so once an allegation is made, then it is for the person who is accused of having been discriminatory to disprove the allegation. Um, and that goes contrary to most understandings in Western legal systems. Um, even the inquisitorial system works on, a, on the basis that there has been a very thorough magisterial investigation before a matter comes before the court. Um, that is not so in this legislation. The second uh, thing I think that flows from that is that the basis of liability uh, for either direct or indirect discrimination or harassment is that of perception of a person who says they're being discriminated against. So in other words, um, if you feel like you've been discriminated against, it doesn't matter what the objective facts are, that's enough to predicate an action. 
The third thing is that there will be effective state funding in that the, the uh, legislation requires individual states not only to implement the legislation but also to uh, prepare, uh, uh, or, sorry, I should say set up a uh, statutory body that will operate as a funder and an advisor and indeed a prosecutor of actions where uh, it becomes uh, the case that somebody feels like they're offended. So in other words, there's an imbalance be between the uh, accuser and the accused in terms of resources immediately, because if they're a small business, they have the weight of the state against them, uh, both in resources and, and money. Um, and uh, so I think those are some of the, the really egregious uh, problems with this piece of legislation. And that of itself should be enough for it to uh, be defeated. But also, it has been recommended at a number of stages that there be a careful economic analysis as to its impact. That careful economic analysis as to impact has not been undertaken. And so uh, states would be forced under this legislation to move into an area basically in the blind, or as we say sometimes in the uh, English vernacular, buying a pig and a poke. They don't really know what they're getting, but they're having to fund it. So um, I think I, I could go on with the problems, but I think those are some of the ones that spring to mind immediately. The one you consider most critical. Yeah, I, I, well, I think there are probably others that I think are critical, but those, those will do it. <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> Martin. Yeah, uh, uh, could, could you please introduce yourself? My name is Martin Gurich. I'm from the Hindu Foreign Bureau. And it's a question for Professor Buster. Uh, is the, the case of you, you explain and, and phenomena mainly uh, around the Anglo-Saxon world, because I have contributed to the continent of Europe any serious church can function without having a legal form. You know, you have to have bank accounts, electricity, telephone, contracts, etc., etc., etc. But you can do it just like that. Maybe very minor, 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 minor groups may have a one French association on the Fed, a non-incorporated association. But any, any serious church must have some legal form to be able to function. And the other aspect is, I don't know, any bank that will give a loan with any, without any guarantees, you know, legal, binding guarantees with properties or whatever it is, bank accounts, uh, you know, financial, you know, for products. I never heard of just a letter from a bishop saying, okay, I guarantee you that it's gonna 50 million euros for your loan to such and such church. I don't know any bank in Europe that it's a well, these are, are really good questions. Um, I must uh, confess to being um, deeply ignorant of the, <laughs> of the law on all these issues in continental Europe, and so I'm sorry I can't answer that in, in detail. But let me give you a general uh, response. Yes, of course, all, all, all churches have to have uh, uh, entered into contracts such as, as you say, uh, you know, telephone accounts and rates and all those sorts of things. Um, sometimes those contracts, in, insofar as they relate to church property, uh, are covered by the property trusts associations or the organisations. So that, that there's long been that as, an, as a body, a legal entity that, that manages the property trust. Um, but it, is, it just is the case that um, the, the, the Church of England, the uh, Roman Catholic Church for many years, um, has not had uh, this... this legal identity as a body, so that individual, you know, uh, presumably individual priests enter into contracts to um, em employ a gardener or someone with the church and those sorts of things, and the assumption has been that the church presumably will support that contract, but where it gets challenged, and particularly where such large sums of money are involved, then I guess you have to look at what the legal, the, the uh, technical legal situation is as opposed to a pragmatic day-to-day <coughs> -day approach. So um, it would not surprise me if there were similar issues on continental Europe, but I'm not familiar with them, so I can't give you any, any detail. I, I, I guess. Yes. Okay. okay. Um, <coughs> one of the first cases that I did at the bar, excuse me, <coughs> was a case that involved a French uh, financier who'd had uh, two Australian entrepreneurs walk into their office and say that we wanted to borrow, we wanted to borrow what were then um, 50 million francs. And uh, that was so that they could exploit the uh, 
the mother load of a diamond mine in Sierra Leone. And the bank agreed, and they said, what we want, would want from you at some stage is for you to sign a mortgage over a shopping centre that they owned in Australia. And uh, <clears throat> they said, of course we'll do that. And they signed a letter of comfort saying that they would do that. Then they were handed the 50 million francs. They went off to exploit their mine. It didn't go too well. And the company wanted to move in, and they wanted the mortgage. And they said, well, it was just a letter of comfort. You can't make us uh, sign over the mortgage. And so the case that was about whether that letter of comfort they signed in Paris would be enforceable in Australia to force them to give security in Australia, which could be liquidated. So as, as uh, strange as it seems, sometimes uh, those things that are very strange are indeed true. Um, yes, uh, there was something else I was going to say, but now... I'm say, sorry, I interrupted. No, no, that's all right. So, but I think uh, uh, this is, uh, as I say, and historically there's been... Uh, trust and that these things have happened and people haven't needed to go to court, but um, uh, your and your your view that the bank should not normally lend this sort of money without uh, a now binding mortgage or something is, is of course the view that the banks in Australia accept. Perhaps one aspect of this is that we're in a rural uh, uh, city of New South Wales, uh, presumably the bank manager knows, the bishop knows, the other senior people in the community, they see each other in, you know, the circles of the golf club or something like that, that perhaps there was a sense, oh, of course, you know, we, we don't need to take uh, full legal protection because this will be met as a matter of honour. And uh, the fact was it wasn't uh, in those circumstances, at least not before they fought the case out in the court. Um. Jeffrey Franks. I, I was wondering that the, there's a little bit of overlap between the two presentations that got me a little bit intrigued on sort of Professor Foster, you seem to suggest at one point that there it might be legally advantageous for religious groups not to be corporate entities. And and, and now in your presentation it seems to seem to discuss a little bit the idea that corporate entities can take uh, religious and, and political stances. And, uh, and so I'm interested in, in sort of where you see the balance between the ad advantage of corporate entities being fully enabled to participate in the political dialogue versus this idea that religious institutions may, in some circumstances, have, find it advantageous to not be corporate entities. So, uh, let, let me let me first of all respond by saying uh, very vigorously that I do not believe that uh, churches should seek to take advantage of uh, you know uh, the lack of corporate status uh, to uh, to get unfair benefits. And the other thing I should say uh, is that th this situation is not something where somebody in in Canterbury or Rome sat down and said, "Oh, let's not have incorporated status so that we can avoid our contracts." That is not the case at all. It is a historical situation that's grown up over many years. Uh, and uh, indeed, to, to give them their credit, many of the leaders of the large denominational churches don't seek to rely on defences that they could perhaps occasionally rely on because they do want to be good corporate citizens in that broad sense. Um, so, yeah, look, I, I think historically it's just worked out that way through the different attitudes that uh, have developed over time. I think uh, we are now in a situation, and I'm glad to see that the Royal Commission in Australia is recommending it, where every uh, major religious group that plays a significant role in the community should have a corporate structure of some sort so that they can be held accountable uh, for both their contractual obligations and also their uh, tortious obligations where they're being sued for wrongdoing. Um, I, I think we're going to have to move to that stage, and we, we're in a sort of transition phase now where some of the older groups will have to say, well, it's no longer acceptable for these complexities uh, to be there. Um, and uh, in answer to my part of the question, I think that uh, there is just uh, no philosophical or legal reason why there should be any difference in the liability of a corporation or the defences that they can avail themselves of. So <clears throat> I don't think it's fair to uh, say that you're going to be liable for all the things you do as a religious institution and so that you can't get the defences that an individual would. So if you if you find that uh, being 
a uh, corporate person is more convenient for trading or for uh, affecting your business than being an individual, then uh, it should just be treated as if they were individuals. Legal personality should be should make no difference on either the liability side or the defence side. Can I perhaps add one or two points? Uh, uh, those who are attuned to the debates in this area will know that the Hobby Lobby cases uh, raise these issues in, in the United States. Um, and of course, the, the, the majority of the Supreme Court there said that a closely held corporation, all of whose members had particular religious commitments, should be regarded as having religious freedom rights. And I think that that's uh, appropriate. Um, the contrast with the case that uh, Neville was mentioning, uh, Christian Youth Camps in Cobor in Australia, was that the Christian Youth Camps organisation, as its name will tell you, <laughs> was a, a religious organisation in my view, very uh, set up with uh, specific objectives to further their particular religion. But uh, uh, the majority of the court took a very narrow reading of what religious organisation was in those circumstances and said that since this arm of the group uh, runs camps to raise money for the church, uh, the arm of the group that runs the camps is not a religious organisation and can't be given religious freedom rights, um, mm. which I, I, I think is probably a wrong decision. Mm. Um, for those of you who are interested, I, I went, meant to mention before, on the first footnote on my written paper, I mentioned that I run a blog called Law and Religion Australia, um, and uh, I have some comment on the Cobor case uh, historically on the Law and Religion Australia WordPress site, and so those who wish to uh, look at some of these matters can have a look at that online. And, and uh, I'm grateful to Neil for uh, raising that point. Could I just add this, that um, it seems to be uh, an assumption that when a religious body enters into commerce that somehow it's no longer a religious body. Uh, that to me is an absurd proposition, but nevertheless it is a strongly held assumption on the, lot of, uh, on the part of a lot of courts who deal with these matters. Mm. And that, that's certainly an assumption that I think needs to be challenged for its lack of logic and its uh, inconsistency. Now, can I just say, of course, there are going to be difficulties, as the US Supreme Court recognised, in large multinational corporations being regarded as having a religious uh, perspective, mostly because the managers of those such organisations won't have a shared religious perspective. So there'll be nothing in the documents that set the company up that has a shared religious perspective. And so, it, it, in many ways, it doesn't make a lot of sense to talk about um, the uh, religious freedom rights of IBM or... Mm. Uh, Qantas, uh, to take an Australian example, or uh, other major corporations. But where you've got a smaller group or a group that is very clearly defined under its uh, originating documents as having religious perspectives, then it seems to us that there's a, a good case to be made to saying, well, if people choose to run their business through a corporate structure, that doesn't mean they necessarily give up uh, the human right to have uh, religious freedom rights protected. Mark? Mark Damon, and then Rodney. Uh, Mark Barwick from Human Rights Without Frontiers. I was interested in your presentation very much. First of all, I want to thank you both for very interesting presentations. I will uh, enlighten on a number of points, particularly in the Australian context. And it was uh, originally addressed to you, Neville, but I think also you, Foster, you have some things to say. It's, it's a little bit of a, another justice position that I can present. And um, it's something I've always wondered about. And uh, in the context of the Equal Treatment Directive, and also a lot of other case law now, is um, the distinction, uh, how is it that, um, how are we able to extract particular instances of uh, protecting religious opinion, let's say, or freedom to express an opinion, mm -hmm. from others? And um, I guess I'm thinking against the backdrop of my own um, growing up in um, a very segregated United States where uh, a lot of the arguments that are put forward about uh, inclusion of uh, gay and lesbian people uh, mm. were you could you could take that out and put black in there mm. as precisely the same <clears throat> argumentation that was there including mm. and I hear my grandmother speaking now even as I speak you know <laughs> I mean how you know about about marriage about um, political correctness, if you will, you know, yeah. about um, you know acting according to one's belief, and of course, a lot of that was buttressed by religious conviction. Yes, 
you know, biblical, strong theological, I mean, let's, we can go to South Africa too, of course, but I'm going to speak to my own country. And um, how, how does that, how's that distinction made? Because to me, it seems like we're talking not about special life, but we're talking about basic freedoms for all people. Yes. And I think if you would speak to most uh, LGBT people, they would not say we want special rights, we just want to be treated as as part of society. I, and I think that's right. I think yeah. that's absolutely so I right. It always puzzled me how that's how that yeah. is segmented out like that. Yes, and, and I don't think there's a, a simple answer to that at all. Um, I've heard that argument before, and I think that it has a lot of uh, credibility. But perhaps, perhaps the way to approach it would be, how, what sort of harm are we talking about when we're talking about shielding people from harm? I think that as somebody who says their conscience directs them to um, have people going out and uh, uh, beating up people who are gay or who are uh, trying to disadvantage them in particular ways, um, certainly that that uh, that should be protected from, and that should be something that's uh, that's uh, not uh, countenanced at all. But just taking another example, and this is not a direct answer, but it's it shows the real dilemma for these juxtapositions. What happens when the neo-Nazi party comes to the Jewish baker and says, we want you to bake a cake that says the Holocaust never happened. Now, in Europe, there are certain laws that prevent that, but let's, let's just theoretically go to Australia where there are no such laws. Should the, that Jewish baker in conscience be driven to deal with this person as a matter of con uh, commerce when their conscience is so deeply offended? Now, personally, I don't think there should be any problem with a Christian baker making a cake for any customer at all. But there, apparently there are people who are so profoundly offended that I think the gay person would be um, well advised not to go to that person because of their particular beliefs. But and So I think it comes down to whether we're talking about essential services, whether we're talking about discretionary services. And I think the way to think about it too is to flip it around and see whether the Christian um, client should be going to the gay baker and saying gay rights are terrible for all Christians, bake me a cake like that. Um, in the end, I think there is some offence we just have to be able to, to soak up and just take as being part of being uh, in a Western democratic liberal society. And there are some offences that actually are destructive and actually move people beyond the immediate parties into some sort of offence taking and indeed some sort of uh, public disruption. But in, in terms of where the calibration should be ended in striking the balance, your point is a good one, but I think the, the counterbalance is also a good one. I don't know exactly where we'll find the middle ground, but I think it will be in redefining what we consider to be harm, that not all events is harm, and that sometimes we just have to live in a society where we are offended. And the civil rights movement, of course, had a lot of violence attached to it. And that was one of the difficulties we have in using that as an analogy, because um, so a lot of what would happen in that, in fact, all of what happened in that, where it was discriminatory, was wrong. But it, it takes on a moral flavor from its context that perhaps is slightly different from what we're talking about now. And uh, people, uh, I mean, then we get down to the biological arguments, we get down to all sorts of things parency arguments. Um, so I think this is a nice way of saying, I don't quite know what the answer to your question is, but I think there are many considerations in it. Yeah, let me just say just briefly, I think, I mean, I, I, I have some, this discretionary argument, I understand too, it's, it's, it can be a confusing issue. This yes. Is yes. And if I were in that situation, I would probably try to make different choices too. But if, if we were pressed up against the wall and say that um, today, if I were a, um, a white baker refusing to, to do a, a wedding cake for a person of color, yes, we would most of us would find that outrageous. Exactly. You know, yes. And are we in a similar place in our the evolution of our social consciousness, etc.? I mean, I, I that's that's of course an open question. And, and that, that, that is that is the very difficult. I've just I've just got yeah. one more thing to say. Uh, that is the very difficult question that we do face. But there's uh, there's. One other example that I think would have to be fed into our, our complexity here, and that is the doctor who provides medical services who has 
a, a conscientious objection to abortion. A, a Catholic doctor, should he or she be forced to perform an abortion or to refer them on? I think in the end, there has to be a compromise on both sides. There has to be a meeting in the middle. And in fact, there has been such a compromise reached, um, at least in the state of Utah in recent times, where they have what's called the Utah Compromise, where both sides have met and they've said, look, we don't want to be at each other in the courts forever. Let's see if we can work out a compact where the religious people with their conscience can live with the people who have a different view of life so we're not in the courts all the time. And I think if we can find a way to inform the public conscience, as you were talking about, in a way that doesn't have us going to court all the time, that would be far more desirable than what we're seeing with this litigious structure that we're constantly setting up. There are a number of things I'd like to say, but I uh, and too, we should talk <laughs> later. But perhaps, perhaps one thing I could focus on is your specific example of... Um, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a white baker refusing to bake a cake for, for, for a black person. That is clearly uh, unacceptable and wrong. Um, the, uh, the, there's a difference between that and some of the cases that have come up in the United States of people whom you might call in the so-called wedding industry, whose job it is to devote, to devote their artistic talents to the celebration of weddings. So um, that they have said, uh, and uh, I think, you know, there, there seems to be a justification for it, their own claims, that they are, uh, uh, and uh, there's a particular case of a florist in Washington State who, who served people with flowers for many years who are from uh, same-sex uh, background, but will not want to serve in the celebration of a wedding because it stands to be contrary to a fundamental conviction that they have. And I think that is quite different to a decision not to serve someone on the basis of their status. It's a different issue where you're being asked to actually celebrate the occurrence of a, of a marriage, which you feel is fundamentally contrary to your religious beliefs. Um, I think there is a, a significant difference in that case. And uh, look, there are lots of other things we could say in that area, but perhaps we'll better uh, see if there's other questions. Uh, Martin Robert. Yeah, it's quite a simple question. Uh, what is the for both of you? And do, do you know many cases of churches that were legally forced to sell their properties in cases of sexual abuse, uh, in cases. Um, I understand that uh, uh, some some Anglican dioceses in Canada have uh, gone bankrupt uh, through being forced to pay damages awards over child abuse. Yes, so it's it's entirely possible that that will continue to happen. Uh, and it's connected to the properties held in trust. Yeah. Well, I. I I'd have to go back and look at exactly what was going on there, but yes, I imagine that they were forced to sell property that was being held in trust for religious purposes uh, in order to uh, to satisfy. Well, either they were forced to sell or they've gone bankrupt in the sense that they they just can't pay their debts. And uh, I'm not sure of the implications of all that, but certainly there's some of them I think have had to liquidate uh, assets in those circumstances. Uh, and uh, I, I, I know a couple of the advisors to both the Catholic Church in Australia and the Anglican Church. And their early advice when these claims started coming was to establish a dedicated fund that could be drawn upon for either the payment of damages or the settlement of cases. So in Australia, as far as I'm aware, before the case that Neil talked about, um, there hasn't been a case for uh, for that purpose. So I think, I think the answer is generally no, but there may be exceptional cases such as rural dioceses that may have uh, been required to do that, as in this particular case. I think Robin had a question. Yes, thank you. Robin Kukani from the city, a Jewish contribution to inclusive Europe. And um, I'm quite, uh, I'm really fascinated by the conversation and the way of looking at the issue of you know, cooperation or not in relation to uh, the human conscience. And, um, and I'll challenge you. And, um, I mean, it, it was interesting to hear the story of a Christian youth group, and when you were first telling it, I was hearing the, the LGBT these youth who may be homosexual, who need counseling and help and all of that, and I was thinking like a rehabilitation kind of thing, and then to hear that the, that the, that the, that the center refused them, I thought, yes, because, you know, why should they need rehabilitation? But this is all my own perspective, of course, with the way we're filtering things, and there is no neutrality in there at all, and certainly this kind of 
denomination in Europe in the secular perspective is highly discriminatory for religious groups. And we're seeing that, and there's a lot of us who are working for that. Um, and we need to really find a balance, you know, of course, uh, where we can have uh, an honest exchange of beliefs and be authentic in that. Um, and not feel like we have to tap ourselves at the same time, not um, not discriminating people in their fundamental human rights. Right. So of course we need to find that balance, and sometimes it's very challenging on certain issues uh, more than others. So I'm wondering around the equality treatment directive. Um, I mean, it seems maybe it's more of a problem of implementation than legislation, actually, because we recognize uh, that's what I've heard that you know there is a kind of correction that needs. Take place and that there is uh, discrimination uh, that's quite widespread against people for a variety of reasons, including religion. And equal treatment directive would bring religion an equal status in terms of other grounds in which there is discrimination. The most common, of course, there are some who aren't mentioned in that legislation, but in terms of the most common, um, so race, ethnicity, religion, orientation, gender, it would bring them to equal status. And wouldn't the, equal, wouldn't the directive be actually an opportunity to clarify how to have that balance? I think it would, and I think that's a very good question. I think I think the directive in concept is a, a good piece of uh, thinking. I think what we have before us is poorly constructed. Mm -hmm. I think that the calibration that I've been talking about has not been thought through, and I don't think the calibration that it exists in the current piece of legislation reflects more modern thinking because we have to remember that, uh, well, in, apart from uh, sexual preferences, it also uh, protects certain religious groups or gives a person who's offended religiously in commerce a right of action as well. Now, if we think about some of the blasphemy laws that we find in the Middle East uh, that are used as a, as a weapon of... Uh, of the majority uh, beating up on a minority um, with really dire uh, consequences, that is a potential way in which this legislation as it's currently framed could be used, uh, just in the religious context alone. So a Christian could take offense at a Muslim or a Muslim could take offense at a Christian and they would have uh, rights of action that are based upon perceptions with a reversal of bonus of, uh, bonus of proof with uh, certain presumptions coming into aid where proof of their case and with its inequity in terms of the funding of litigation, so I think that I think that the uh, the calibration there is is screaming out for reworking. Um, but the idea of this, uh, I, I, I'm probably not very far away from where Mark is uh, going in what in his comments. I think there does need to be some protection, but I think there also needs to be some give and take, and we don't have that in this piece of legislation. Right religious accommodation or reasonable accommodation in terms of various factors. That's There's no good, such defense, really no such defense in this. Not really it's not there. But would that be a... That would be a good, example? that would be a good thing to add. If they had um, legislation like they had in the Victorian case um, that gave, gave a religious defense uh, and then made it clear that corporations could avail themselves of it, then I think we'd be getting to a point where um, the Equal Treatment Directive is getting much closer to a fair piece of legislation. Can I say, and I, I realise we're probably almost out of time, but just to comment that uh, uh, one of the issues that Neville is focused on is this question of, of, of offence being caused. And that is quite a different matter to a specific harm being done to somebody in terms of being denied employment um, or denied a service and those sorts of things. And that, I think, is where we get the intersection of religious freedom and religious free speech issues coming up. And it is quite a serious matter. And just to illustrate very quickly, uh, we had a case in Australia uh, brought against uh, the Tasmanian uh, bishop, uh, Archbishop of Hobart, who had distributed a leaflet to Roman Catholic schools describing the Roman Catholic view of marriage and outlining the view that the church did not support same-sex marriage. A person in Tasmania took offence at this, a person not even involved in the school took offence at the distribution of this booklet and took an action against the Archbishop in a tribunal. Now, that action has just now been, a few days ago, been dropped, but the fact is there's been a lot of effort and energy and expense taken into defending the claim already, and it gives you an example of the sort of thing that could happen, that people could be charged with offending others simply for 
telling people within their own religious group the views that they hold on religious matters. And it seems to me that's the sort of matter that we need to be seriously concerned about. Uh, if this now, and again, Neville knows much more about the precise terms of the directive, but if legislation allows action on the basis of offence uh, alone, it seems to me that that's going to be very problematic. Thank you. We, we actually have uh, one question from uh, an online viewer, uh, Lisa. So this is from Fred Axelrod, who's asking Professor Rocker, and it's on a more political note. And um, it's a likelihood that the Equal Treatment Directive will be revised. revised. Is there a mention to do so in a way that addresses your concerns? Um, at the moment, the way it stands is that there is only <clears throat> one objector, both on substance and on and on form, and that is uh, Germany. There are a number of other people uh, or a number of other representations among the EU that I think uh, would have objections, but they're afraid of appearing um, extreme in their views or being uh, what's commonly called homophobic in their objections. And so they they um, have not looked at it in a way that I would advocate, which is to look at the, uh, the legal and economic problems with this and forget about any of your your uh, uh, religious institutional objections, because there are enough problems with it legally and economically for it to be caused uh, for there to cause a, a serious revision that would address many of the concerns that we've been talking about today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's fine. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for your questions, your participation, and thank you, Professor Foster and Professor Rocco, for uh, your presentations. And, uh, thank you. You have been very enlightening.